Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, whenever you're watching this, uh, how are you doing, Flood students? Um, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Stephen Wynn. I'm the student pastor at the Lakes Church. I'm really, really grateful that you've tuned in uh, to our study on the life of Moses. Um, my prayer to this study is that we'll be able to see God's faithfulness, uh, learn uh, who Moses was, and also learn from his life, and also the fact that God and uh, used him even though he uh, was not perfect at all. Um, and so as you guys are entering into the summer, I know um, this time um, usually is filled with trips and all the things in which you can imagine. But again, uh, with the things in which are going on uh, with the pandemic and also unfortunately with all of the things that are, are going on in the news about um, uh, kind of with the injustices of the world that's going on, um, Maybe your southern plans have changed or whatever it may be, but uh, my hope is that you would just see the Lord is good, that he's faithful, and that he's going to lead us through our time. And uh, my hope is to be able to um, go through um, kind of how everyone is feeling with everything that's going on with the injustices and kind of um, everything that's going on with George Floyd um, in our Zoom meeting tomorrow. And so my hope is that you guys would join us for that discussion. Um, but as we kind of go on with this month, we're going to be looking through again the book of Exodus and even more specifically at the life of Moses. Now, it, might, it may seem crazy to spend an entire month following the life of one man, but you'll soon see that the whole book is a testament to God's power and majesty. Uh, for those of you who love history, this is your month. For those of you who like stories that play out like sweet movies, this is your month. And for those of you who could identify with a main character who had a crazy upbringing, messed up a lot, and yet was used by God to do incredible things, this month is for you. When you think of Moses in Egypt, you think of the movie The, the Prince of Egypt, if you've seen it, or maybe the image of Charlton Heston, uh, part in the waters and Ten Commandments comes to mind. But probably not, but that movie came out when your grandparents were kids, so, you know. If you've seen it, then great. Let, let me know. Um, but to really, uh, but to really the understand and know the story of what's going on and why we are, uh, why things are going on, we have to take a step back and in, into the book of Genesis and look at some of the people who were connected with the beginning of the book of Exodus. See if you recognize any names as we read the first part of Exodus. So, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to uh, Exodus. We guys be studying chapter one, so Exodus chapter one, verses one through five. Um, it says this: uh, These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family: Reuben, Simon, Levi, and Judah, Eschatar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Neph, uh, Nat, uh, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 and all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Um, if you've been going to church for a while, you might recognize some of those names. Jacob and his brother Esau were the sons of Isaac, who was Abraham's son, um, that he almost sacrificed. Jacob was the one who tricked his old father into giving him his brother's birthright. Many years later, Jacob wrestled with God until his identity was changed. And it was there that God gave Jacob the name Israel. So Israel and Jacob are the same person. Then the rest of the names are Jacob's sons. And so this passage is saying that all of Jacob's sons, who are now known as the sons of Israel, went to Egypt, where their brother Joseph was already. Joseph is very important here because back in the book of Genesis, this same Joseph was his father, Jake, uh, Jacob's favorite son, and was sold into slavery by his brothers. See how this is all tied together. So Joseph worked his way up through the ranks of uh, Egypt's government, from there being a slave from all the way up to being second in command and only answering to Pharaoh himself. Just in case you didn't know, Pharaoh is not just one person in all of your history books. Pharaoh is a title like king or president, so there are multiple pharaohs throughout the history of Egypt. You'll see why this is important in a second. So look at, uh, look at Exodus 1, uh, verses 6 through 7. Now Joseph and all of his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful 
and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. So Joseph and his brothers were all gone, but the community of Israelites who were the descendants of Israel, also known as Jacob, grew rapidly as God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Exodus going to verse 8 and 11. The new king, who did not know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies to fight against us and leave the country. And this sets up the book of Exodus, which continues the story of God's people, the Israelites. The, the time between Joseph's death and the beginning of the Israelites' persecution by the Egyptians was about 220 years. So during this time, pharaohs have changed multiple times, and the current pharaoh does not know who Joseph was or the history of Joseph's people, the Israelites. The Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves, making their lives as horrible as possible. They continued to multiply and grow. So Egypt, afraid of the Israelites rising up against them, made a rule that when an Israelite or Hebrew baby was born, if it were a female, she could live, but if it were a male, they, the, they would kill the baby. But the Hebrew midwives who helped deliver babies refused to do this, and so God blessed them, and the Israelites increased even more. One of the boys uh, born during this time was hidden for three months after his birth. Knowing that she couldn't keep him safe, his mother put him in a basket and sent it in the Nile River. At this time, Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile River and found the basket. She opened it and felt sorry for the baby. The baby's sister uh, popped out and asked if Pharaoh's daughter wanted one of the Hebrew uh, women to nurse the baby for her, and the woman agreed. So the sister went and got her mother, the baby's mom, and Pharaoh's daughter paid her to take care of her own child until he was older. And once he was older, it was time to name him. Pharaoh's daughter named him Moses. So now we get into the life of Moses. We see how the same God who called and walked with Moses calls and walks with us today. Uh, turn with me to Exodus 2, 11 to 14. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. And he saw an Egyptian man beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrews? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought what I did must have, must have become known. This moment is so significant because it shows that by the time he reached adulthood, Moses, who was raised to essentially be in the royal family, realized he was an Israelite. The fact that Moses was willing to identify uh, with God's people and defend the Hebrews may have caused him to act radically, but it also showed that he had faith in God. Moses rejected the temporary pleasures of sin for the uh, honor of suffering for God and with God's people. Luke, Jesus' disciple who wrote the book of Acts, puts it like this in Acts 7, 23 to 25. It says this, when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. What I want you to understand from this is that no matter your past, God has a plan and purpose for you. Moses had one of the most messed up uh, beginnings to his life. He was supposed to be killed as a baby, but instead he was spared and floated down a river filled with crocodiles and all sorts of other animals. Uh, he was picked up by royalty and then raised by his biological mother. Then he was separated from her and raised as someone else. And he grew up with an identity crisis, which led him to had led him killing a man. Well, I doubt any of you have uh, done that, uh, and whether it's a pleasant one or one filled with struggles with your past, God still has a plan and purpose for your life. 
maybe you were raised in a Christian household or where or no one uh, know where the name of God was only uh, used. Maybe you were raised with a loving family or you didn't have a family. No matter how you were raised, God still has a plan and purpose for your life. We have the advantage of being able to read the full story of Moses and how God used him so we know it all works out in the end for him. But imagine the struggles he was encountering as he was trying to figure out who he was or what to do after killing someone. If God can use Moses, he can use you too. Word got around to Pharaoh that Moses had killed an Egyptian, so he wanted to have Moses killed. So Moses fled to live in a place called Midian. The Midianites were descendants of Abraham through, uh, through Abraham's second wife, who he married after Sarah's death. So Moses fled to Midian, where he met a priest and his daughters and, and eventually married one of them. He then lived there for 40 years and raised a family. Let's look at Exodus 2, 23, 25. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out and cried for help because of their slavery, went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked up on the Israelites and was concerned about them. There's something powerful here that I want us to understand. When you turn to God, he responds. After many years of oppression, the people of Israel uh, began to call desperately on God for help. Before this time, many of them had been worshiping Egypt's uh, false gods, and they had probably been depending uselessly uh, on them for help and relief. But when they turned to God, turned to the Lord, and, cry, and cried out to him, he responded. Let's look at Exodus 3, 1 through 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Hor uh, Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through uh, the bush um, was on fire and did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why? The bush does not burn up. Now, before we talk about the burning bush, do you realize that what Moses was doing, he was washing over sheep and they weren't even his own sheep because for Moses and each one of us to prepare for God's plan for our lives, it may take a season of preparation. Again, it may take a season of preparation. Even though Moses had received the highest level of education in Pharaoh's royal household, his education was not enough to equip him for God's work. He needed time alone with God and 40 difficult years of tending sheep in the desert to prepare him for his future task of leading Israel out of slavery in Egypt. Moses was over 80 years old at this time. He had to wait quite a while to fulfill God's plan for his life. So God caused Moses from the burning bush and then ask him to do something incredible. God says that he's seen the misery of his people in Egypt and wants to rescue them and lead them to a different place. God says that he wants Moses to go and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And in Exodus 3, verse 12, and God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I had I." that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. You have to realize that when God has caught you to do something for him, God will be with you. We don't serve a God who leaves us high and dry. We don't serve a God who asks us to do something and then doesn't provide what we need to do it. We serve a God who, when he calls you to do it, we will see you through it. So Moses says, suppose I actually go and do this. And they asked me who you are. What should I tell them? In Exodus 3, verses 14 and 15, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. 
This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. One of the most powerful statements God made in the entire Bible is, I am who I am. What's powerful about this is that God was saying he, that he wants to be known as a God who is present and active. He didn't say I was who I was, that he was the God who wants to be remembered for doing all the great things of the past, but by saying I am who I am. He is saying that he is the God who does great things today. He is saying and declaring to Moses by his true name, Yahweh, I am Yahweh who I am. God is declaring to him by his name that he is with him. Not only that, but but as Jesus was being questioned in John 8, he, he used this same phrase and called himself I am, which led him slipping away while everyone grabbed stones to throw at him. We serve a God and a Savior who is not who was. The same God that was with Moses is the same God who is with you today. It may seem like you're all alone as you're going through your struggles, just as Moses felt all alone as he left Egypt and went through the desert trying to find his purpose. But God is there, and when you turn to him, he responds. It may not be in a loud, audible voice, but God will respond in his own special way when you turn to him through his word, through prayer, and through worship. Things may not turn out instantly. Remember, for Moses, it took a season preparation, but just know that God will be with you through it all. I'm excited for this study in the, uh, in the life of Moses um, and through the book of Exodus. And my prayer is that we'll be able to see uh, that the God, of the, uh, the God of the Bible is alive and active today in our lives. Um, uh, through the Holy Spirit, through prayer, through gathering together, which I'm, I'm hoping that we will be able to gather together soon. Um, and my hope and prayer is that we'll be able to see God mightily uh, through as we study the life of Moses. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you, Father, for the students. And I pray, Lord, that you just be glorified um, uh, in us, Lord, and through us. And I pray, Father, that the situation in which uh, we see in our world today, Lord, um, that there would be peace, uh, there would be understanding and listening. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, guide us, Lord, as we uh, go through um, uh, asking for your wisdom and for your uh, healing, Lord. I pray, Father, for our students, Lord, that you just be with them, Lord. And uh, thank you, Lord, that summer. And I uh, pray, Father, that you'll be um, with us. Thank you, Father, for your science. We need to pray. Amen. Awesome. Looking forward to our time tomorrow on Zoom. Um, be looking out. Be on the lookout for our Zoom link. And um, looking forward to seeing you there. All right. God bless.